You rolling? Yep. Ready to go. The second question and answer session starts now. Carver Fest 08, Mr. Bob Carver. <coughs> <laughs> All right, what characteristics slash benefits made him go with the Yugo tubes in the 390T, 490T, and C19? Uh, boy, that was a long time ago, but if memory serves me correctly, it was I tested a whole bunch of tubes and found that those had the lowest noise of all the tubes I tested. Uh, and uh, they were really very, 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 very consistent at that time. Those were military grade tubes. That's the reason they were so good. Okay. Next. Next question. What is your favorite amp, preamp, et cetera? What is your personal favorite of Carver gear? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> that is like asking a parent, which child do you love the most? <laughs> that question is way too tough for me. I love them all. You don't lean toward one versus another. So well, seven, maybe well, if you put, if you press me, I would say some of my firstborn. Yeah, those, those are always parents' favorite. <laughs> cube, cube. So that would be the cube. <laughs> you know, the 1.0. Those are some of those early amps. The 500 Ts, the 500s, the M500s. Those are. Yeah, they're all, but I love them all, honestly. There's nothing to choose one over the other. Except so which my one first was your problem amp? My problem amp would have been the uh, flame linear, oops, uh, face, <laughs> face, sky, sorry, a, bad CEO. He said uh, 700, phase 700, because they blew up for a while until I figured out how that I should put more output transistors. Next question off the beaten path from audio. How far can you get your planes to come back from? Well, my planes are tethered on lines. I fly combat. And when you fly combat, there are two contestants, one next to, to each other. And if you take a video of the model airplanes, they're going too fast to catch on camera. So the cameraman always takes a picture of the pilots. And it looks like a ballet dance. It's two, two men are in mortal combat, and the planes are off in the distance but they're tethered on 60 feet. Once in a while they get away and they never come back. They fly <laughs> off into the blue when the wires break. That's combat. Next question. I would like to know all the details about the Bob Carver, Carver Corporation split up. Please do explain. Well, uh, I was the CEO of Carver Corporation in, my, in a past life. And uh, one day, I came to work. Well, let me back up a little bit. It was a privately owned company. Then I took it public. When I, after I took it public, the investment banking community said, Bob, you have to have a good board of directors. At the time, the board of directors was my daughter, my dog Zeus, and a bunch of yes men. <laughs> yes men. <laughs> and so they said, no, you have to have an independent so I brought on this independent board of directors, and we were profitable, and we were growing, and we were selling lots of amps and stuff, but they wanted, they had visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads, and they wanted it to be even bigger. So they said, we're going to start selling amplifiers to Shucks Auto Supply, to Walmart, to every, every mom and pop store in the world that was, had nothing to do with audio. And I said, no, no, it won't work. Can't do that. And they ignored me and thought I was an impediment to success and growth. So one day I walked in to a normal boardroom and there around, sitting around in the, in the corners of the room and along the walls were these people in suits. And there was on the boardroom table a big tape recorder running. And those guys were in suits and I knew something was up. I just, because I had never seen them before. But they were attorneys. And so somebody made a motion. We make a motion to have Bob kicked out, essentially. And everybody seconded the motion, and out I went. I was heartbroken. I didn't see it coming at all. So then, so then I went off and I started Sunfire. And it got even. Because <laughs> in the marketplace, Sunfire was successful. They really tried to, to make the stuff, Carver stuff, very inexpensive and, 
and slapped their name on it, and, and they opened up Shucks Auto Supply and the drug stores, you know, those where they sell lipstick, and, <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't work out, and so they, their sales went down the tubes, and they went out of business. It took a long time. It took way longer than I thought. It took many, many years for them to go through all of the, all of the money that, that we had saved up in the bank for being successful for all that time. And then once that money was gone, they had to go bankrupt. So that was the story of my ouster from Carver. From a voice beyond the wall, do you have any other questions? No, that, that was very satisfying. That was a lot more information than I had heard from anybody else as far as the details of what really happened. That was a good answer. Not, not, the, not the most uh, uplifting question, but a very curious one. Yeah, it was fine. They, they, they could take the company away, but they couldn't take my wealth away. They had, the, the, law is, the law said, well, you could take his amplifiers away, you could take his children away, you could take his house, you could take, but they couldn't take my, my wealth, which was the stock I had in the company, and so I just sold it off. That was that. I actually sold it to the directors because they had visions of sugar plums dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Took a little more of their money. <laughs> so, yeah. so. Okay, this is from a goofy guy somewhere. What was your original inspiration for the Carver original Amazings? <clears throat> well, the original inspiration went back many, many years to high school, my high school days. Popular Science published a loudspeaker uh, article, Build It Yourself, called the Sweet Sixteen. And it was a panel speaker, it was a piece of cardboard, and it had uh, 16 drivers on it. And it was, how many of you remember the Sweet Sixteen? Ah, and I see. So I made a Sweet Sixteen, except I put eight on one channel and eight on the other, because in those days there was only mono, so Sweet Sixteen had to be two times eight. That was the original inspiration. And um, I just liked the way it sounded, and that was then it evolved into the uh, into the amazing. But a flat panel with sound going out both sides, and uh, and it evolved into me into making a ribbon slowly and gradually because that was better. Did the Apogee speakers have any bearing on your design choice, or did you choose from multiple speaker designs and then try to achieve a flat response from that decision? Oh, the Apogee had, a, had an effect. Um, I really stood on the shoulders of as many people as I could put under my poor little feet. I stood on Arnie Nudel's shoulders, on the guy who designed the Apogees, on uh, the guy who designed the Sonus Fathers, Peter, Peter Serblin, and John Dahlquist with the DQ-10. All of those speakers had some characteristics that I really enjoyed and liked what I heard when I played them. And so I incorporated all of that into the Amazings. As far as the shape goes, well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but those, if you put them on the ground and put them together, they look like model airplane combat wings. And so they became known as the surfboards from hell for many of our dealers. But the shape was determined because they looked like model airplane wings. That's the truth. My pitch at the time was, no, it, that wasn't, it wasn't because they looked like model airplane wings. I didn't even mention it. Uh, what I said was, they have a slope like this so that the low frequency eigentones are broken up and don't develop by a flat, perfectly sided uh, panel. And that went over. Everybody believed that. <laughs> it's probably, it probably has a grain of truth to it, or maybe even a lot of truth. 